out of Brentwood, New York. McGirt is the former IBF junior welterweight and WBC welterweight champion. During a 15-year career, he posted a record of 73, 6 and 1. There were probably a few more fights in there somewhere. 48 KOs. Ladies and gentlemen, James Buddy McGirt. I'll be glad to have you back. Uh, we were without you last year, but uh, glad to have you back this year. Uh, some of the thoughts on being here this year with Tommy Hearns and Sugar Ray. When they get on the stage, you play the ring of bells for that. <laughs> <laughs> How's it feel to be back? It's great. I mean, you know, I love coming to Kansas Soda. <laughs> Shouldn't to be honest. It's not the same, you know, without the guys up waiting with Joe Frazier, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, we laugh at the joke. So now Chuck is that getting that. We, we laugh at the <laughs> It was Chuck's but uh, it was his book right now, you know what I mean? Because, you know, when you, the amount of fighters today don't have the sense of humor of the older guys. So, but, you know, the great thing is that the fans are here, and that's what it's all about. It's, all about. it's not about us, it's about the fans, because without them, we would be here. Well, we were, we were feeling it yesterday, uh, uh, in St. Magic, for the first time in 20 years, we had more special guests and celebrity uh, boxers than we did Hall of Famers. First time in 20 years. Yeah. And uh, then we just started naming off the, the you know, God rest your soul, the deceased, and those that are struggling with health, we do, uh, and uh, Carmen, and, you know, but those years past, we used to look at that back row, and they're uh, right down the Kid Gatlin and Sandy Sandler, you know, in those days, back uh, not so long ago. It's not the same, but, you know, like I say, realistically, it's about the family. Okay. And have a good time. So me and Joe Frazier are here to sing, me and Chuck are here to sing. So Listen, it's not wrong. <laughs> You got Christ and Andrew here, man. Oh, okay. Can you sing what's things out? Absolutely. Tonight, you and me. Okay, we're going to do, we're gonna do uh, the I Get Tina Turner song. Are you Ike or I'm Ike Tina? I'm Tina. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I don't wear high heels once. Uh, <laughs> Any questions for Buddy? Yeah, right here. Oh, no, don't give him the mic, man. <laughs> Again, good morning, everybody. I want to start it off by asking you, what was the toughest fight of your career? I'm not talking about your wife, but seriously. We're on the weather, too. But seriously, what was the toughest fight that you might have said to yourself, damn, I don't want to face this guy again? Uh, when I won the title for Frankie Warren. Ah. Uh, that was, no, not, not Frankie Warren. Oh, Warren. Right. Frankie Warren. It was, I can say that after the fight, I went home, and I stayed in bed for about two months. <laughs> oh, wow. you know, I mean, I have a big head, but my head was swollen after the fight. So, you know, you couldn't even, I mean, it was, it was, and I won, so you can imagine how you felt. You know, I got a, I had a, a filling in my mouth, he knocked out in the seventh round. Hit with a left hook, knocked out of my mouth. And it was, you know, it was, it was, I've been to hell. <laughs> I put it there like that. But, you know, the, but then again, it was also a great moment to win a championship. Question on your what? What do you think about these uh, young guys lately uh, messing around with steroids? And, uh, lately, in you know, we, we've heard the names of these old men. You know, what do you think about that? Like the whole time, all they did was run on chop wood, get the bag, get what they had to do. What do you think about these two guys in the steroids? I think that it's a disgrace. You know, I think it's really hurt the sport. I feel that if you if you if you're an athlete, not only a boxer, any type of athlete, and you got to take any type of enhancing drugs to make yourself better, I think you have to question yourself as an individual. I mean, because you can't really say, how can you live with yourself knowing that you did, you cheated? You know what I mean? And, and uh, that's why I feel today when they say these guys today are great, none of these guys today are great. There's no great. And the only, there's two fighters today that I say are great. It's Mayweather and Marquez. You know what I mean? No, he's not great. Good, very good, great, no. I mean, I'm sorry, but you know, that's just my opinion. You know what I mean? He's a very good fighter. I don't think he's a great fighter because great fighters make adjustments. He's not able to make adjustments against Marquez yet. You know what I mean? So when he's able to make those adjustments, that's when you got a great fight. You know, you get great, great Robinson, great fight. You know, come and sit and read once. He made the adjustment in the second fight. Came back and well, it was tough, but he did what he had to do. When he fought Gene Toma, you know, Muhammad Ali, when he fought Frazier, you know, when these guys are able to make adjustments and come back and defeat the guy, then, you know, those, those are great guys. Or they can change their, their, their battle plan in the middle of the fight. You know, when they get in the middle of the fight, one thing's not working, they switch it up. Fighters today, if it's not working, you know, I mean, they have to creep out of power. So, I mean, it's just not the same anymore. You know, I don't watch boxing like I used to because 
You know, I grew up watching the old school guys, and those are the guys that I, I respect and always will respect. Well, he had a lustrous post career as a trainer. If you could share with us just some of your concepts, some of your beliefs that when you were uh, doing the, you know, heavy the training of uh, fighters, and, uh, that was, what was your uh, uh, motto? What was your well, I, I was, you know, when I had a turbo, God bless him, Vernon, God bless him also, and you know, Antonio talked about it, I was still training, you know, when I had, when those guys, they, when they come in the gym, they came for work. And I have, a, I have a thing that is, when you come in the gym with me, don't ask me who you should want, don't ask me how many of you want, just get ready. I mean, you, you pay me to do a job, let me do my job. You know, if you come in and tell me what you want to do, then basically I'm not doing my job. And, and, if, and if I let you take that control, how much respect are you going to have for me? You know what I mean? I just think that, you know, today a lot of fighters don't have respect for the trainers. And I think that's what's really hurt, hurt the game. You know, um, when I was fighting, you know, you never actually trained enough. You, didn't, you just got dressed. If you were sick, you got to, I, I told my trainer once, I don't feel good. He goes, why'd you come? I had no answer. You said, get dressed, you box. And that was that was all it was for. Now today, you know, these guys they tell the trainers what they want to do and how they want to do it, and it, and it just should be like that. We were we were talking briefly yesterday, and uh, uh, Marlon Starling Star Star made some comments that seemed to, to fit the mold of it. And then John the Beast Mugabe spoke yesterday and kind of pulled the thread together as well. He was saying that when you fought in those days, you fought for your name, your pride. Money was part of it, but it seemed that money's Right now. Yeah. I mean, I, I read once where a fighter turned out of the fight and says, three and a half million is not enough. I mean, it's not enough. I mean, are you kidding me? He goes, no, I want five. And TV went and negotiated with him to get the five million. I mean, when I was fighting, they, they called us, and I know Chuck, you know these stories. They said, listen, we got a guy, uh, we got 70,000 on the table. Do you want it? And if the manager said, call me back, they would call somebody else and say, look, we got to fight for 60,000. And they'll take it. They called my manager once for me. And I just started, I just went to training camp. I didn't start training. And he says, buddy, you know, they want to fight this kid on, on TV next week for 50000 I said, what do you mean they want us to? What do you mean? I said, we, we taking the fight, man, because he didn't start training yet. I said, look, this guy has never fought nobody. Yeah, he's from, he's from overseas. He hasn't fought nobody. I said, we start training tomorrow on Sunday. We train all the way to Friday. We fight next week. He goes, buddy, I said, listen, you want to cut a 50000 in one week? But you want to cut it fifteen thousand after five weeks? And he goes, I take a cut of fifty thousand. Thank you. you know I mean? so, and the kid was it was a kid named was Gary Jacobs. He was undefeated. I'm like, this guy don't the box, man. He was undefeated. I'm like, I can beat this guy. You know, it was the easiest fifty thousand ever made. And the quickest, I spent the quick. <laughs> well, the, the, the problem I see is it's, it's not so much the, the fighters' fault. I, I, I don't. It's like in other sports. Where the, the management, the ownership, they're willing to pay the guy. You know what I mean? Then they, they, all of a sudden becomes a money game and, they, and they, a negotiating game. And, and if you're willing to pay the guy, then the guy's willing to take it. You know. What I mean? So it's it's kind of a double-edged sword where it's gotten to that game. Where and it, it takes the fun out of it. I think. You know. I mean. You know. You had guys like you know Ray Leonard and Tommy Ryan fighting each other. I mean, they was getting big money. Not like now, but they, you know, making big money. But there was no. Uh, well, I'm not going to take, Ray didn't say I'm not going to take 10 million. Ray, I'll take 10 million, you know. Today, these guys, I don't want 10 million, I want 15. Oh, let's split it 50-50, come on, man. And, and I think that is taking, a, it's, it's hurting the fans. Because the fans are not getting to see what, what, what they really want, which is, you know, good fights. Well, so, the Pacquiao Mayweather thing is, because somebody, somebody doesn't want 50 million, million. 40 million. Exactly. That's, I mean, uh, I mean, I wouldn't put up my right arm, but shit, I'll fight both of them right now for two million. <laughs> He's round there switch the punch switch. <laughs> I mean because you know when you know when I was fighting we loved the game. It's not like that anymore. Question right here, buddy. Yeah, buddy, you, you mentioned you don't really watch the fighters here today and uh, you like the old school style. And, and here we have coming to the Hall of Fame, Sugar Ray Leonard, Marcus Martin Hagger, of course Tommy Hearns. A lot of these guys were trained by old school trainers who in turn were uh, you know, picked up their habits from other trainers from long ago. So in your opinion, has something been lost along the way? Or, or what's your assessment of, of trainers nowadays? Because I agree with you that a lot of fighters aren't of the caliber that they once were. You know, it's, it's funny. I'm glad you asked that question. This is, you know the bits. People say now that if a guy, if a guy knows how to use the bits, they think he's a good trainer. 
This is putting that guy's good with the pistol. It, that's good, but the pistol hit back. I mean, what is he going to tell you when you get in the battle when the guy starts kicking your ass? I mean, if you can't resort to the bitch, you got to say, you know, he's got to have something for you. I mean, boxing is the only sport where guys work the corner who's never had a fight in their life, never really understood the game. The basketball, football, any other professional sport, those coaches have played either in the, in the college or professional. And boxing is not like that. You know, I mean, this guy's not working on cards. What am I having on cards? He's putting the best midman in the business. I really don't give a shit. You know, because come, come with a, it's in a fight, and the guy's in a, a life and death situation, you gotta know what to tell the guy. And if you've never been there, how can you? You know, so, I mean, I think that that's what's really hurt the game. Don't give him the mic again, please. <laughs> Listen, he gives me a little bird eagle. Uh, he gets a check when I leave. You know, I want to share something with you folks, and, and what Buddy McGirt is saying is, is absolutely true. First of all, he was old school when he was a fighter. He fought anybody, anytime, anywhere. Whatever he was offered, that's what the, what the purse was. But more importantly now, Buddy McGirt is one of the rare trainers in the game. I've been in the game my whole life. I did most phases of it. He's the rare guy that will stop a fight when... 99% of the other guys would continue to let the guy go. But he's been there, done that, knows what it's like to all of a sudden wake up after the second round, now it's the ninth round, and he didn't know what happened in between. <laughs> Just a bad story, this is pretty bad. <laughs> but, but, you know, I want to compliment him on probably not only saving guys' lives, but where the guy, when he's 60, 65 years old, is going to be able to talk to his grandchildren and his friends and be understood. Thank you. Hi, buddy. How you Listen, doing? Can you tell us your best story about Arturo Gatti? Because he was my idol. Uh, the best story about oh, Arturo Gatti? Thanks. Oh, God, okay, let me... I gotta pick a clean one now. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, man, is this, is this so many with him? And he was... I, I, I got one. It's, it's, uh, he was getting ready to fight uh, the kid, the Ren, from uh, Canada. And uh, they sent some guys in the, you know, the box with him. And one guy came in, he looked just like the Ren, you know? And the guy was from Canada. So he comes to me and says, Coach, I really need to talk to you. I said, what's up, Arturo? He goes, who's the fucking rocket scientist that sent this kid in the pretty squad with me? I said, your manager. He says, well, I'm locking him out today. I said, what, the, the kid? He goes, yeah. I'm like, but it's not his fault. Yeah, I mean, he goes, but he took the job. I mean, he goes, so put him in second. Let me do warm and put him in second. I'm going to knock him out. I said, I said, don't knock him out. Knock him down, but don't knock him out. He said, all right, Coach, I'll knock him out. And then I'm going to send him home. I said, but you got to pay for the week. He goes, then I got to knock him out. I'm going to pay for the week. I got to knock him out. I said, look, I told you, you can't knock him out, man, because, you know, you're going to, he's a young kid. He goes, all right, right, coach. I said, just knock him down. I said, if I see you getting him, I'm going to stop him. He says, all right, you got it. And for like three rounds, you know, the guy was really putting pressure on him. And then he came to the corner. He says, coach, I don't care if you get mad at me, but I'm knocking this son of a bitch out. I said, all right, because the guy, the guy had got the best one like the round before. Because you know, Arturo was trying to like, knock him down, but not knock him out. So he was getting caught in between punches. So when he came back, he just looked at me and said, Coach, he's going now. I said, I, I couldn't argue with him. Yeah, I mean, he knocked him out. He paid him. He paid him for two weeks, you know, to, to soothe the pain, and then he said, The moment. 